What is up everybody? Unrested here and it is December 1st. That means no nig November is over and I can finally tackle a video that pretty much people sent me all no nig November. Now if you don't know what no nig November is or you're just tuning in, we're back to JFAC. This is a JFAC right now. Japan's frequently asked questions. I'm unrested with the questions you requested and the most request question through November was this video that was up on, I believe, uh, Ryan Boundless's channel. Um, and I believe I watched it on the original channel that was on, which was um, something versus Japan. I can't remember the guy's name, and I really, I should. That's disrespectful. Um, Justin versus Japan? No, I don't think so. Ed versus Japan? No. But it was called Do Not Teach in Japan, or teaching in Japan sucks, or teaching English in Japan sucks, or teaching in Japan sucks really bad. It was one of those titles. I believe, though, it was Do Not Teach in Japan. Um, and I've actually, I've watched the video twice, and I've watched um, Victor, Give Me a Break, Give Me a Flake Man's commentary on it. Um, I was asked to do a commentary on it. And for those of you who write me and are like, you're so hard up for videos, you've got to do a commentary on another video, um, you might want to stop watching YouTube altogether because almost every single YouTuber ever has done a commentary on another video. Ryan has done his commentaries on other people's videos. I've done mine. Almost every single J vlogger has done a commentary. So you should probably stop watching J vloggers because we do commentaries on YouTube videos because we are YouTubers and it's kind of our business. It's kind of our grounds. It's what we do, what we watch, what we're part of, the community we're part of. If YouTube also enjoy being part of the community than just, I guess, deal with the fact that people do commentaries. Anyway, it was one of my most requested questions, so for the most part, I think we're going to have a pretty happy audience that I finally covered this, and that means I need to jump right into it. Do not teach in Japan. There's a lot of positive messages in this video that are truths, um, and there are a lot of negative ones that are kind of either, I don't want to say not truths, because the guy's not lying at all. There's no lies in his video. Um, what he experienced is definitely 100% true. Now, mind you, everybody's experience is different and how you experience Japan is different for everyone. And what they leave Japan and take away from Japan is their own. They own it, okay? No matter what anybody's gonna say or argue with, even me, myself, when I make this video, no matter what I argue with, his experience will not change. He will still have had the same experience. So in every aspect of that, he is telling the truth. So. Um, this is in no way to disrespect his video. Um, in fact, there's going to be many parts where I salute his video and extol some of the messages that he sends because they are some very important messages in that. Um, on the second hand, though, I will say that I always believe my channel is kind of this happy medium in between the people who are Japan apologists and constantly praising Japan and saying how wonderful it is. Like a lot of nothing wrong with them, college kids who come here and only spend a couple weeks here or a couple semesters here and then head home and had a wonderful time um, and don't see anything wrong with Japan at all because there are problems here. There's some big problems here, just like there are in any country. Um, at the same time, I'm not gonna be um, super negative about it where some people are very bitter when they live here. Um, I myself am a fan of Ryan Boundless. I do like his videos. I enjoy watching them, and I think they tell a lot of truths. I think it's good to have him as part of the community, even though he doesn't want to be called a J-vlogger. That's okay. I think it's good to have him as one of the people who comments on Japan because he keeps it balanced. For every super, super overly positive, can't see anything wrong with Japan person, there's Ryan who tells you some of the worst parts that he's experienced. And I think that's important because it gives everybody a balanced picture. But I also think what I'm about to do here, which is a happy medium in between, is also important because you should get a little bit of both sides. Let's jump right in. So do not teach in Japan. This guy talks about how he worked for a company called Winbei. And I want to make sure you know that name right away because the stuff he tells about this company is most definitely true. It's a horrible company. Most Akai was pretty much suck. Um, the only Akaiwa I've never heard anything bad about is ECC. GABA I've heard horrible things about. Winbei I've heard horrible things about. Nova I worked for and had horrible things happen to me. So everything he tells about with horrible things happening to him at his company, truths, all truths. Um, I don't disavow or think anything he's saying is not true about the horrible things he experienced. He talked about everything from his company, um, co-workers betraying him to um, I guess not getting the, the area that he wanted to settle down in, um, to not um, getting the lesson times and hours that he wanted, 
Um, now I am going to get a little bit into how some of this is kind of expected and some of this you should research, which I, I felt like I've watched this video twice and, and it's kind of vague or whether or not he researched it a lot before he went there. Um, I will say this. He did say he wanted to go to Japan since he was 10 years old, I believe, in the video. And he had a lot of expectations. Um, of course, he did do his research. But one thing I have noticed, some of the most people who become the most disappointed when they get here or try to live here are the people who had expectations before they headed to Japan of what they thought it was like, or people who had wanted to go here for a very, very, very long time. Now, I'm not saying that's not a reason to come here if you've always had your mind set on it good enough, but it's that expectation that I see when it's ruined that either people are so depressed by it or so upset with it or so downtrodden by it that um, it's too much for them and they, they have to leave or go to another country like he went to China, which is fine. Um, as I've always said before many times, Japan is not for everybody and it really, really isn't. There's a lot of things here that people could tell me I didn't like this and this is why I left and I could be like, I can totally see why you would leave because of that. That makes total sense. Um, I myself do find some things here very annoying, um, but there's also things in my own country I find very annoying, so I don't really find them enough as a reason to leave. Um, so, this guy worked for Winbay. Um, I, from what he says, he only worked for three months in Japan. Um, now, he did get the worker experience, which is very different from the tourist who just comes here and sees all the pretty things and then leaves. But one thing he does say is that he believes after he makes a video, there'll be people who negate what he says or say the opposite of what he says or say that he doesn't know what he's talking about um, and that you need to live here five years to really know Japan. And he's right, you don't need to live here five years to know Japan. You don't need to say, oh, you need to live here a super long time to be an expert on Japan. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, that's not true. You can really, I mean, you live here about two years and you, you really know your area pretty well. You know your part of Japan pretty well. You know what you like, dislike, enjoy, the good things, the bad things, etc, etc. Um, one thing I will say though is three months though is not enough time to really know Japan. Um, three months is the equivalent to how long you can have a tourist visa for. So literally he didn't get out of the time boundaries of a tourist. So, if we can really take his word as far as what long-term life is in Japan, no, I don't think so. Um, also, another thing he says is that Japan was really boring for him, um, but he also mentions that he was put in a very small rural town when he was put somewhere by his company. They, they chose the place for him. He did not get to choose the place, which is very common. Um, you should believe that 100% that his place chose the, com the, the area for him. Um, at the same time, I don't know if there's any country in the world where if you got placed in a very small rural town that you would have a good time, that it would be very exciting, especially at his age, my age, or any younger age where you're not looking to settle down with a happy family. Um, you know, probably at this point in my life where I have settled down with a happy family, I would probably still be okay to live out in a rural area because I'm not a club goer, I'm not a bar goer, um, I don't drink a lot, I don't party a lot, uh, my life is pretty calm. But if you're coming here looking for excitement, or if you're coming to any country looking for fun and excitement and really good times, a good nightlife, a rural area is going to be boring no matter what. So I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, I don't know, how, how would I say that? I'm, I'm kind of perturbed that he would rate Japan by the rural town that he lives in because, like I said, I think any country in the world, especially America too, a rural town in America sucks. Um, it's not a lot of fun. There's not a good nightlife. There's not a lot to do. Um, I guess I've written a lot of things down here, and I'm just going to kind of mention them as I go through them. I don't really have any um, list of positives, list of negatives. I just kind of have a list. And some of them are positive, some are all negatives. And um, I hope I'm giving you a balanced feel of how I viewed and took in this video and how it came across to me with my own perspective of Japan and living here for uh, going on 10 years now. So, uh, okay, he says he couldn't save enough money. He made 2500 a month, the equivalent of in American cash or uh, Niju Goman um, in Japan. And he lived out in a rural area, which it, I'm kind of unsure how he wasn't able to save enough. He says that he's really good at saving. I myself am super bad with money, 
and my first job, I only made that much, I only made $2,500, and I paid $750 a month for my apartment. Um, I never had a problem buying food, I never had a problem saving money, I never had a problem um, paying bills back home. Um, he does complain that food is very expensive in comparison with America, and I think that is true. Fruit in Japan is very expensive compared to America. Um, but fruit and food is very cheap in Japan compared to a lot of European countries. And even some Australians have told me that anything that's not fruit, they said fruit in Australia is very cheap, but most of the other foods are actually much cheaper in Japan than they are in their own countries. So I guess if you are coming here as an American, do expect to pay higher prices for fruit and for some foods, but at the same time, it wasn't enough to break the bank for me. And I'm from America too. so. I'm kind of unsure as to how he wasn't able to save unless there's some sort of debt we weren't aware of that he was having or paying off school loans, that might be very hard. And that might have been a situation we don't know, unfortunately. Um, that part was left a little bit vague. Um, number two, no contingency plan. Now he says that he was always excited about Japan, had been expecting to come to Japan and um, I guess had done a little bit of research about it. I, I don't completely understand how much he had done because it's a little bit vague how much research he had done about the company either um, if you have done research about the company and it does come across as very bad like when I researched Nova I knew I was coming here with a very bad company it was an awful company but I knew I was gonna get my work visa and that was gonna keep me in Japan and that was what was important to me um, I had a contingency plan ready that I would start looking for new jobs as soon as I got there. Got my work visa, I'm legal in Japan, that's all I need, I can start looking for the next job. And that's pretty much what I did. Within two months I had a new job. Um, and within two months Nova was bankrupt, so I guess everything worked out. Now that's, that's, that's what I'm a little bit confused about is why if you knew that the company was sort of a bad or had a bad reputation or people had said bad stuff about it, you wouldn't come here with a contingency plan. Or if you didn't want to be put in a rural area like they did with him because he said he wouldn't know until he got there where he was, why didn't you have a contingency plan? Or the first week when you found out you were unpaid for training, why you didn't start to look for a contingency plan? The first week I would have found out I wasn't paid for training, I'd have been like, this is a shit job, I need to start looking at other jobs right away. And maybe I would have worked there long enough to keep my paycheck for the first couple paychecks or something, but I would have had stuff going on the back burner constantly. And maybe that's just me. Um, I don't really feel like that's over preparing. I feel like that's always having a contingency plan, which I think you should definitely have because you have no safety net when you head to another country. Your parents aren't there to let you stay at their house. Um, so have multiple contingency plans. Okay, um, betrayal. Now here's one I'm gonna actually agree with him. He says that he was betrayed by his coworkers because um, they kind of got him drunk and talking about the company uh, in a bad way. Well, no, no, actually, he doesn't actually talk about the company in a bad way. He just says that he's not sure what he's going to do next year, and they betrayed him. They go behind his back and say that he's going to quit. He gets yelled at by his boss. His boss is like, when are you going to quit? I heard that you're going to quit. And he's like, I never said anything like that. They also said that he, like, talked trash about a student, which he says he didn't do. And I believe him 100%. If you watch one of my videos from a long time ago, not that long ago, maybe one or two months ago, um, I had an assistant that I was working with who was constantly making up shit, just trying to create problems for me. Let me make something very clear, and this is very important. When you work at Japan, the company comes first. Um, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not saying yay for this. It Actually, I think it sucks. The company comes first before everything, and the Japanese people you are working with have this mentality that the company comes before everything to the point that they will sacrifice their own health and sleep and free time for the company. Um, it's destruction of the self for the betterment of the company. It's something they did during World War II and it continues on into this day with their companies. I'm sorry this is true. Yell at me all you want. Sacrifice of the self for the company. Sacrifice of the self for the greater good of all. Um, that being a company, I don't know if that's the greater good of all really though. Um, and it's to the point that if you do have a partner or you do have someone you work with every day, you shouldn't consider them like buddy-buddy. They're gonna keep things purely business. Um, and if you do step out of line, if you do make a mistake, they might go behind your back and tell your boss about it. And I think that's just something you should take into consideration. It's not good, it's not cool. Um, it does always make me a little bit sketchy when I'm working. 
um, in any Japanese company because they believe that the company comes before all else, business comes before all else. And that's not them necessarily going at you to stab you in the back, but it's keeping you on your toes. And uh, it's just something you gotta watch out for. Um, so, let's see, 33 classes he says he had to teach a week. I don't really see where that is too much. When I worked for Nova, um, I had seven classes every day, five days a week. That's 35, um, and I didn't feel like I was overworked. Each class was 45 minutes long. I only had 15 minutes in between each class to prepare, and I felt okay. Um, but then again, teaching, once again, teaching English, edutainment as you're doing in Japan, you're not actually teaching. Um, it, it, it takes a certain type of personality. It takes someone who can just light up a conversation and start jumping right into it and if that's not you then you do have to prepare a lot you do have to make a lot of lessons and this is what this guy said he had to do um, maybe that type of job the akaiwa type of job where you do have to have lesson after lesson after lesson ready wasn't for him and i can understand that but again this is going back to the situation of japan is not for everybody same with english teaching in akaiwa that's not for everybody. And if you don't know, Okaiwa is English Conversation School. And that's another thing I want to bring up. He says there's only two types of jobs in Japan. And I think this kind of shows his inexperience with English workplace culture in Japan. There's many, many more. Um, you know, there's business classes you can teach which pay really good. They pay like 40 plus bucks an hour, sometimes 60 bucks an hour. Um, you can teach college level if you have your master's. You can teach. Um, International Yochien, which is International Kindergarten, which usually has pretty good pay and pretty good hours too. Um, then you get into ALT, which the hours are pretty good. The work is insanely easy, possibly the easiest work you will ever have in your life. Um, but you end up sitting around a lot because you don't actually have much to teach. And then you have Akaiwa. Um, and I really think Akaiwa is the worst deal of all of them. That's what he chose to do. It makes me wonder how much research he really did put into all the different types of English you can teach in Japan. And if English really wasn't his thing, why didn't he look into learning more Japanese and getting into things outside of English? I mean, it's something I've done myself. It's something a lot of us have done who've lived here a long time. But then again, that's what that takes as someone who's lived here a longer time. Three months is probably not going to let you get into that unless you come here already speaking almost native level Japanese, which I can't expect anybody to do. I can't do that still to this day. So I'm not expecting anyone else to. But at the same time, if you don't have that option, who really is left to blame other than yourself? Any country you go to, you're going to have to speak the native language to get into native businesses. It's even even English-speaking countries that speak, you know, English on a native level. You know, many European countries, you still have to speak the European language. You're going to have to speak Spanish in Spain. You're going to have to speak Italian in Italy. Same thing. It's not much to ask to speak the country's language. Um... Okay, what else do I got here? Um, uh, nothing to do. He said there's nothing to do in Japan. Um, again, that shows like a level of inexperience of, or maybe just not getting out there. I, I don't really, I mean, aside from the fact that he lived in a rural area, if he meant there's absolutely nothing to do in the rural area, again, that's, that's a rural area in any country. Um, it's countryside. You know, I don't, I don't know what you're expecting from the countryside of any country. Um, you shouldn't expect much, but if you can take the train into the city, there is a ton to do. And again, this comes with living there for a while and finding all the nooks and crannies that people don't talk about. If you just skim the top level of gaijin who've been here for only a very short amount of time, and you might find a few places you kind of like, but the longer you stay here, the more hidden away places, the more places you find that are very niche, like you can find clubs that are only metal, are only into goth music, are only into punk rock, or bars that are only into a certain type of anime, or an anime theme, or just entirely around one type of manga. And those are awesome. And you can really get into whatever you're into and have a crowd there that is super excited to talk to a gaijin that's into the same thing. Um, there's so many possibilities. Um, it's it's endless. I could never for a second agree with there's nothing to do in Japan. I It just inconceivable aside from the fact that you would stay in the countryside and look for stuff to do there, which again in any country there wouldn't be anything to do in the countryside. Um, let's see, what else do I got here? Um, chicka, chicka, chicka. Oh, not a real teacher. Not a real teacher. Um, I'm not sure what he was expecting. 
Um, anybody who's read anything about going to Japan knows you're not going to be a real teacher there. You don't have, you know, like a Kyoshin no Minkyo. You don't have a Japanese license to teach. And the TESOL thing, those are shit. I, I'm sorry, man, those are shit, dude. Like, those don't get you any jobs anywhere in Japan. I know plenty of friends who've gotten jobs all over the world, South Korea, China, you know, they didn't need TESOL at all. I, if you really want to take your time to get TESOL, I'm not shooting down TESOL. I'm not saying, um, you know, it's you're a piece of shit for getting it or anything like that. I'm not being harsh on you, but it doesn't actually make you like a for real teacher. It may teach you some very basic aspects of teaching ESL, but I mean, if you want to talk about a real teacher, I, I mean, I have my certificate to teach as a teacher in Florida with a minor in education and the credits that actually make me, you know, a, a paid teacher, I can teach art there and be an actual, you know, government level teacher employed in public schools. But here in Japan, that doesn't mean shit. <laughs> and I don't expect anybody to think it means anything here because I wasn't actually going through any kind of training classes or anything to be approved in Japan. It's the same thing where if you come over here to do, you know, uh, a farming visa where you can work on a farm with a farmer, if you feel like, man, I should be a real farmer now, you shouldn't. You're, you're just helping someone do their job. And that's the same thing with any English job that you're teaching here. You're helping someone do their job or you're helping a company do their job, but you're not an actual teacher, especially a Kaiwa. I don't know why you would think that that would make you an official teacher. Those are very corporate. There is no official quote unquote teacher. Even the visa itself is called an instructor visa, I believe. Um, or a humanities visa, which at no point does it actually say like teacher's visa or anything like that. So I'm not really sure why you would imagine that you would be considered a real teacher. You haven't gone through the same training, the same schooling, and the same licensing that actual Japanese teachers have gone through. So, and I mean, you could, you could, you could become a Japanese national. You could learn Japanese well enough to read enough kanji to take those tests. Nobody's stopping you from doing that. No one's saying, no, hell no, you can't do that. Uh, I'm sure somewhere in Japan there is people who have done that, but until you have, why would you expect them to consider you a real teacher? I don't, I don't understand that. And then the other thing was Japan's level of English. He was really surprised that they didn't have a lot of respect for the level of English. And it's true, he's totally right. Japan sucks at English. They totally suck at English. I mean, it is one of the lowest English literacy rates in the world. I'm sorry, that is 100% true. Very few people, even in Osaka, where it's a big city area and very international, speak anywhere close to native level English. They might know a handful of words at best. And that's Japan. I mean, if you, if you did research it before you come here, you, you would know that. I came here not expecting to be able to speak English to anyone. And I personally actually came here because I wanted the challenge of having to new, learn a new language, of having to learn Japanese. Uh, whether or not I've really succeeded in that is questionable as my Japanese still sucks. Um, but it, well, I will say it has learned it has taught me how to learn the basic building blocks of learning a language in your head, which is something I never got in America. I really like that here. Um, and it's taught me a lot about learning communication through body language and stuff too. But again, research, research is important. Um, and it's something you should always do before you come to Japan. And it's something you should always do for the company that you're gonna work for before you come to Japan. And if that company is shit, if it sounds like it is shit, which this company was, this company, do not get me wrong for a second, this company fucked this guy over. This company was not cool at all. Um, this is by no means this guy's fault that this company fucked him over. It is all 100% on them. Winbay, remember that name and never work for that company. I will be the first to call out any shit companies like this one was. And this guy worked for a shit company. Now, I can kind of see why he left Japan because of that. I can agree with him that that would be a shit ride. That would suck. That would be horrible. Um, I think if I came here and I didn't have any kind of contingency plan and I had gone through the same thing like I did with Nova, I might have left. And a lot, a lot, a lot of people did. A lot of people left just like this guy. Um, I came over here with 40 teachers on the plane. And I met all of them. And we started the same day. We started the same week. Um, we all started the same school, and none of them are left. There's zero. I'm the only one. So, I, okay, one of them is left. 39 went home. Um, now, mind you, they didn't all go home at once, but I would say probably about 30 of them went home right after Nova went bankrupt and belly up. A lot of them went home in the first week. They couldn't take it. They, they hated certain aspects of Japan. And again, that's because Japan is not for everyone. 
the final thing that he ends his video with that I really, really have to disagree with. Like I said, most of the stuff I agree with him there on is he, he got screwed over. He 100% deserves to say, I wanted to leave Japan because my company fucked me over and they were shit. He's 100% right. His company was shit. Um, but the thing I will say is he ends it with saying, do not work in Japan. Do not teach in Japan. And I cannot agree with that. What I can agree with is do not come to Japan with zero contingency plans. You're in a country, you're in any country that you go away from your home country and you need a contingency plan. You need a safety net that you can create yourself and rely on yourself. And if that takes you having multiple job offers when you get there or having another job that you can fall back on or starting to look for another job when you get there, then you need to do it, okay? There is a very big possibility that everything could go fucking wrong, all right? And that's something you need to consider. You need to think the worst, hope for the best, but expect the worst. What if I do have to go home? What if I hate this job? Be ready for that because you're far away from home. Be ready for that. Um, I think saying do not teach in Japan is really bad also because it's saying do not teach what every single English teaching job in Japan. I don't think you can make a blanket statement like that. There are some really goddamn good jobs. I have some friends who teach in college who are living a baller lifestyle. They teach like one or two days a month. They make crazy bank um, and they're living the high life. I myself teach part time still to this day because it's a little extra income on the side. Mind you, I have gotten out into other businesses of art. Um, I enjoy my life immensely here been living here a very happy 10 years, but there has been some really goddamn rough years. This year was especially rough, and you can see that in my past videos. But if I was back in America, would that not have happened? No, it probably would have been some of the same experiences. A hard job, a job you don't like, a job that treats you bad. This can happen in any country. It's you making the best of it and giving yourself multiple plans, a forking path of decisions so that you can get out of bad situations. And that's exactly what I did was I got out of the bad situation. My first year in Japan was brutal too. My company went bankrupt within the first two months I was here. Again, I made sure I had multiple ways of getting out of that situation. If you come and you don't have those, things can go horribly wrong. If you come and you don't research, things can go horribly wrong. If you come with expectations that are outside the realm of possibility or bigger than what the actual reality is, things can go wrong. And that's something you should always keep in the back of your mind. Things can go wrong. Have multiple plans. Have a safety net made for yourself. Have a contingency plan. Make a forking path of decisions. I hope I've covered this as well as I can. Again, nothing against this guy, nothing against his channel, nothing against Ryan Boundless. They are great channels. This guy has made a great video and I think it's a good video to listen to as a word to the wise, as a word to those thinking they can just jump into Japan and have a super happy time. Videos like this need to exist. Videos like his need to exist because without those, everybody thinks it's a candy land. And I can't tell you how many times people have written to me trying to tell me how I don't know what the hell I'm talking about even though they've never been to Japan and that the country is wonderful and everything's beautiful and people wear cosplay costumes all the time and dumb bullshit like that. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe, there's, there's some people who don't even believe I live in Japan, which here, I'll show you some Japan in the background. There we go, there we go, see that? Is that, is that enough proof? I, I promise it's not a green screen. It's not a green screen, guys, I promise. Um, so just, just realize that. Come here with a plan. That is JFAC, Japan's Frequently Asked Questions. I hope I've thoroughly answered that one. I hope you do watch Ryan Balance's video and you watch What's His Face versus Japan. Sorry, man. I'm really sorry. I don't remember your name. That's really rude. Um, watch those videos. Still watch them and still hear that guy's tale because still listen. You should definitely listen to the story of what the worst possibility is. And this is what happened to this guy is. It's real, it happened, it's true. He really did get screwed over by his company. Companies like that do exist. You should learn about the worst and the best and everything in between. You shouldn't take any of our opinions as the solid only proof of Japan. You should take everybody's opinion and you should listen to all these different videos and you should form your own and have your own expectations and your own contingency plans and your own ways that you're gonna keep a safety net underneath yourself when you get here. I'm unrested with the questions you requested. Have a good one.